Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we'll be welcoming back a wonderful guest who's joined us here on the program before. We're talking about his new book, Conscious Food. It's sustainable growing and spiritual eating. I'd like to bring back to the Beyond 50 radio program today our guest, Ms. Jim Pathfinder Ewing. Mr. Jim Ewing, how are you doing these days? I'm doing great, Daniel. Good to hear. Now, tell us about this conscious food. I mean, it's pretty interesting to think that in a time and an age that we need to experience a lot more of this. Well, uh, conscious food, this book grew out of uh, my wife and I have a small organic farm. And uh, if you've read my previous book, you know, this is my sixth book. And my previous books have been on energy medicine and Reiki and shamanism and things of that nature. Uh, our little farm here, uh, what what struck me was the the joy that, that I have in growing and, and providing food for ourselves and for other people. And uh, I guess what really started it all was uh, I was out there working in the field and and uh, this great sense of joy uh, I felt when I was working in the field and growing these things and knowing that the love that we were putting into the, to the soil here uh, with uh, this beautiful day and all like that was coming out back to us and this beautiful food, which was really a living prayer to be able to provide something like this. It's a walking prayer to give to other people in this way, and it, it created a great circle of life. It is a sacred and wonderful thing. And then I came back in the house and uh, was online or something and ran across how, you know, there's another food scare about, uh, uh, you know, some, it was uh, uh, for a type of meat. And uh, it turns out that uh, my wife and I, you know, we try to be careful and conscious in the food choices that we have. And one of them was uh, a particular meat that we bought was a uh, uh, bison. And uh, Mm -hmm. we thought it was uh, perfectly good. It turns out it was part of this recall, so I got to looking, and uh, they had used some kind of fuzzy words, you know, about whether it were, you know being grain fed, but it was finished on corn, and so uh, because of that, it had this type of uh, 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 you know disease and so forth, and and so we, you know, it really hit me hard. I thought, well, here, here I had this beautiful feeling of of love and, and gratitude for being out in the field and growing these things and sharing these things. And then here is another food scare that not only that that they had misrepresented this food as uh, being natural and all grain fed and, and so forth and not not a, a product of the uh, you know industrial food system and everything. Mm-hmm. And so uh, so that's what really started. I said, well, what, how did it? How did we get in this way that food is is uh, is not considered wholesome and nutritious, but is a danger and mm-hmm. is frightening and scary? And that's what got me started. I know even more importantly, too, when you think about what you just said there, how we got to think about food the way we do. And I don't know if it's just in America or if it's this way around the globe, but I'd kind of maybe just hazard to guess it's mostly in America that food is kind of one of those things that people call it fuel. You know, there it is. You're just separate from it. It's something I need to stuff in my body when I feel empty and then I go about the rest of my day. But as we're seeing more and more often, one of the more alarming things, at least to me, is hearing young children and teenagers telling you how tired they are. I don't remember ever using that term when I was a kid. What's going on there? There has to be sort of a connection, I would think. Well, that's exactly so. Uh, The more you look into food and food nutrition, you see that uh, we're eating uh, empty calories. In other words, right. you get uh, that's one of the problems we have with with uh, uh, you know, a childhood obesity. We have cardiovascular disease, hydro, uh, uh, hypertension, all these things. You know, we've gotten into a situation where the food that we have in front of us is is not good for us, and mm-hmm. and that's that's uh, it's a contradiction in terms. Which why <clears throat> in the book. I wanted to find out why, how did this happen? How, how you know, this may be the first uh, generation that uh, lives, uh, has a shorter lifespan than the parents in, in modern times because of the food choices. 
and because of the obesity and hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and so forth, uh, experts are predicting this. And and so uh, that's one of the things that that struck me was how did we get how do we get this way? Has it always been this way? And what happened? Mm-hmm. I know because, uh, for instance, one thing that's really valuable, uh, uh, along with many things that you talk about in your book, is entropy and centropy. And I think what's fascinating about that, as I was, you know, looking at that, is just recently, for instance, there was a documentary I was watching about corn, and how this particular plant seems to permeate more than just what people think about, which is corn on the cob. But as you alluded to earlier. You know, we have a lot of grain-fed beef. I mean, in fact, we're even feeding farm-raised salmon corn, you know, as if this stuff was just out there in the ocean. But the fact is is that we try to find ways to control, you know, how, for instance, we grow our food to make sure weeds don't get all over the plants and, you know, how they go about this large industrial way of growing food. But then nature finds interesting ways to get around that. So as you talk about an entropy and centropy, it goes from order to disorder. Kind of illuminate our listeners about that. Okay, well, in getting uh, back to that, it, you know, you can allow things to break down or you can build things up. Right. And so uh, what I go into the book is to, rather than allowing ourselves to be victims of of the way things are going, that we can uh, we can have conscious choice to change things in the way we wish them to go. Right. For example, when we're talking about the food choices with uh, and young and people not living as long as they were before, uh, that's called uh, biocultural evolution, and that is that we that what happens is that through our choices uh, that are in our environment, we make these choices, and then it changes our environment when it changes us. It's a it's a synergy. And so I say we can turn this around, turn it completely mm-hmm. around by practicing what I call biocultural revolution, and that is making conscious choices regarding the food that we eat and who we support as far as who is growing it. And in that way, we turn this around. We go into a growing phase rather than a decomposing phase. Mm-hmm. I think what I really enjoy about what I've read is that you tend to approach this for me, the feeling was poetically rather than with an alarmist point of view. You tend, you know, there are plenty of books out there. You pick it up, whether it's on gardening or eating or whatever it may be, and they're just beating up to death about what all these things are doing, you know, that's harming us and causing this. But you're kind of saying, well, you know, here's this, but let's go ahead, as you said, and move toward a solution that's really at our fingertips, but it's about individual choice, isn't it? Absolutely, and uh, not only that, but but it's a choice that is empowering for people and for communities. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the things I go into the book is about community-supported agriculture, and it could be that, for example, you may not be able to grow your own food, uh, but you may have a yard or something in which you can have someone else do it, a young person, for example, who could grow, uh, help you. You could uh, you know buy them a tiller and, and supply the... Uh, seed or whatnot, and have other uh, members of your family or in your neighborhood or your church or whatever go in together and uh, provide good food. And it's a very simple way of empowering yourself and empowering your neighborhood. This is happening on a larger scale in uh, urban agriculture right now. For example, uh, Will Allen with uh, Growing Power in Milwaukee, uh, he took uh, what were abandoned uh, uh, building sites, uh, weed covered with weeds and so forth in the inner city, and started growing uh, organically uh, food. And now he uh, uh, makes uh, uh, thousands and thousands of dollars and employs uh, uh, inner city youth in positive things by providing good food for the people. And so that's why you know he calls it growing power because he's empowering a neighborhood mm-hmm. and uh, eradicating that idea of food deserts. You know. Uh, where uh, there are no fresh foods and vegetables in, in inner city places, he's turned that completely around, turned it into not only uh, something that, that brings communities together, that provides food for elderly people who might not have an otherwise good bi- diet, who's taking kids from off the street who might otherwise be in gangs and, and employing them, giving them good jobs, teaching them things, teaching them self-worth, 
work mm-hmm. th- ethic, and then also providing food that he sells to the local schools mm-hmm. in a farm-to-table type atmosphere. And they're happy to get it because it's locally produced. They know where it came from. It has no chemicals. It's uh, you know no pesticides, no like that. It's just perfectly good food. Mm-hmm. And it's pretty exciting, too, I'm sure, for as you were talking about these inner-city youth, to feel there's a sense of belonging, that there's a sense of contribution, that what they have to offer as far as, let's say, their energy produces a tangible effort that, as you said, builds knowledge. And it gets pretty exciting when you get up each day wondering, for instance, if you're taking a look at that you're growing crops, plants, whatever the case is, uh, that, geez, I wonder what this is going to look like today, you know, and so you have something to look forward to. And it makes something like that a very exciting possibility for everybody. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Edible Prayers, what an interesting title, but I really enjoyed that because, again, you put back the spirit of why we eat in the first place. It's to enjoy it. (laughs) Absolutely. And... The <clears throat> something is lost, is it? it we, but I, I go into considerable uh, detail there in the first half of the book, explaining the history of food and how we've lost our spiritual connection with food. And I think that's very important because for uh, eight of the last ten thousand years uh, in Western society, or what you know, our, an- our antecedents, uh, food was considered something sacred. And it was considered uh, uh, integral to community and was seen as a part of, uh, as something that was given by Creator to us as a sacred thing that we brought into our bodies in a sacred manner. You know, people didn't pray over food just because it's a rote thing to do. They did it out of gratitude, and they did it because it was part of the fabric of life and living and a positive affirmation of life as opposed to death. You know, these are powerful mm-hmm. concepts that are are are, uh, are are a part of our very soul. And it's only been in the last 2,000 years and uh, which in which we shifted from a you know goddess type religions and communal living to the uh, Roman model of a patriarchal warlike society or warlike societies, and uh, food was used as a weapon of war that we became estranged from that connection that we had with food. And there are a number of different uh, ideas and, uh, and perceptions that are part of food that we are divorced from today because we have lost that, that spiritual connection. Mm-hmm. I know back when you look at, for instance, cave paintings and the idea of the hunt, uh, it gave us something to do, but the thing was, when it came to eating meat, that was about the only time that it happened was generally in celebration. And this day and age, we seem to corner the fact that that has to be at every meal at the table all the time, when in fact that even though we do eat that way, that it's not as necessary. And again, it's something we just kind of take for granted, and as you say, We've become separate from it, you know. Well, where does, you know, beef come from? What does that animal look like, you know? What is the characteristic of, for instance, a pig or a hog, you know? Here's chicken strips and chicken McNuggets, but what is the nature of a chicken? And I think that as you come to understand the nature, for instance, of the animals, aside from the plants, that your whole approach to how you eat and how you do things would probably change significantly. That's right. I've got actually got a statistic, and it's in the book. It says, uh, in 1900, 60% of the U.S. population was rural and 40% farmed. Now only 16% live in unincorporated rural areas, and only 4% of the people farm. Now, this has occurred since World War II. And as I state in the beginning of the book, I start off with Rudolf Steiner, who was a, a, a member of the uh, Theos- uh, Theosophical Society. And uh, he actually is the first modern philosopher who warned about uh, mechanization in farming and how we would be losing our connection with the land. Mm-hmm. And uh, what's happened is that, now I'm not saying that we, we need to you know throw away everything, 
No. You can't go back. We're not going to. There's no way you can go back. And I'm not saying that we should. I'm not saying that we all should live in, in communes and and uh, eschew any type of uh, of, of uh, food that, that that's commonly found or commonly grown. What I'm saying, though, is to be mindful of our food choices and to recognize what we've lost and to bring back those things which are the positive things which we've forgotten about to reconnect ourselves with food. Mm-hmm. I couldn't agree with you more about that. You know, I, I remember, it seems, that, and this is just something I came across. Again, I love watching documentaries, and the idea was that it was the invention of the fast food industry that created food production as we know it. <laughs> I don't know, it's kind of a stretch, but in some ways it kind of makes sense. <laughs> Absolutely. As, as a matter of fact, there's a, a real good book on that. It's called... Uh, stuffed and Starved, uh, The Hidden Battle for the World Food System by Raj Patel. I've got it right here on my bookshelf uh-huh. that explains exactly that. You know, it extends on Food Nation and so forth, those others, that uh, talks about the world food. So this is global. This is glo- It's not just us. It's not just McDonald's and French fries. I mean, it's uh, the whole world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, again, you were saying earlier how you got started on this path, but really tell us, what was the awakening for you? Uh, well, I, I think that was one of the things that triggered it, but uh, I, I can't really put my finger on it. I know that, that uh, during my training, is, and I mentioned this in the book, uh, my Native American training, there was uh, one of my teachers, uh, showed me uh, spirit food, and that is how you can live uh, on uh, energy. And mystics throughout time, seers and so forth, uh, are able to do this. And 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 uh, when I was practicing a lot more than I am now, I could do it. I could do it for a you know, certain extent. But um, it's a way of being mindful about your energy, and that is knowing exactly where your energy goes. Uh, in my shamanism te- classes, I taught that the first rule of shamanism is discernment, and that's knowing uh, where your energy, exactly where your energy is going. And that's refined to its highest sense. Uh, you can do that. You can live off of energy for an indefinite period of time. Mm-hmm. With him, he was a medicine man. His father was a medicine man. And when he was young, um, they often didn't have any food. And so his father would sit them all down and say, okay, well, uh, we're going to have spirit food. And so they would sit and they would uh, go through a meal, uh, uh, imagining seeing uh, the food that was before them and and partaking of it. And what that is is a ritual of giving giving thanks for the energy that's provided for you and allowing the energy that's given to you by Creator to be used in a positive way. Now, of course, this is totally uh, uh, away from any type of Western ideas of of energy or matter and things like that, unless you're a quantum physicist. Right. But but the point is that that, uh, when you look at food from different indigenous perspectives, and specifically if you look, when I say indigenous, I mean not only Native American, but throughout uh, global history and indigenous peoples around the world, you see this intrinsic spiritual aspect of food. And people are walking around that are what in Buddhism might be called hungry ghosts Mm -hmm. because they are missing the spirit food, the spiritual aspect of food in their lives that they know as complete human beings of children of earth and sky that they need to survive as holistic beings. It's sometimes hard to approach this subject without getting just a little bit upset or very upset about how we've put our thumbprint on something that at one point we were of the web of life, a strand of it, and now we believe we are the web. (laughs) And one of the alarming things I remember reading uh, in your book was you were talking about species and extinction. And, you know, until it becomes the the big news thing about an animal where, you know, it's reached the endangered, it's, uh, uh, endangered list and it's 
bordering on this, do we ever take action? What we don't tend to see, though, is the extinctions uh, on even the smaller scale levels that could be around us now. You're saying that we see a loss of species, for instance, as high as 150 species per day. Now, that alarms me because it reminds me back in, I believe it was 2000, uh, I was talking with anthropologist Wade Davis, and he was uh, at that time promoting his book, It Was Light at the Edge of the World, and he had an extinction that was just as alarming that came about humanity, and that was the loss of languages at the rate of 1,200 per year. I couldn't imagine how much language has been lost now by 2013, 13 years later. That was his contention then. And when you talk about the spirit of what we're talking about here, that sort of spends humanity in what seems to be a potentially bankrupt spiritually situation, I guess. Well, yeah, that's uh, it's, uh, among Native people, um, one of the things that, that uh, Western society has seen to do is that it separates and kills what it uh, doesn't understand. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that's that's a uh, if you live in a way in which you uh, have reverence for all life, then to see a way of life that is uncaring in such a, a devastating and widespread manner is just a, a, a terrible, terrible thing. We can get angry about it, and we can certainly lament it, but uh, what I hope to do with the book is show that we can take other actions that, going back to Center B again, are buoyant mm-hmm. rather than allowing uh, a, uh, a, a disintegration that are, are turning that around. In, in, uh, in Native terms, you might say heyoka, and that is that uh, I'll give an example from the medicine wheel. And uh, if you're looking in the West, which is the time of darkness and looking, and, and uh, some people call it the journey into night, and a uh, difficult time in your life, you can employ a technique which is called a heyoka or backwards way of looking. And that is that no matter where you are or what you're doing, you can always do the opposite. And that is if you turn around on the medicine wheel, which would be the east, that's the time of enlightenment. That's a directly opposite from the time of darkness is the time of enlightenment and newness and experiencing new things and allowing new things into your life. So if you're looking at death, you can always turn around and look at life, okay? Mm-hmm. That's a very profound uh, philosophical uh, uh, technique that a person can always use no matter where you are or what you're doing. And so that's the way that I prefer to see these things. I outline these things in the book because I think it's important to show what is happening mm-hmm. and that the, the changes that are taking place that are so massive and so incredibly beyond human capacity to, to fully understand has even got scientists saying that, uh, that we've, we're actually in a new era, this anthrop- Anthropocene period, in which uh, our destructiveness of the earth is actually becoming a geological epoch. Mm-hmm. Now, that's a big, big change. Right. <laughs> Something becomes an epoch. But as I also state in the book, that if you consider the earth to be a living being, then, uh, then human beings, for all that we think we are, are really uh, infinitesimal, that our time is ephemeral that we are so, we're just a blink in the eye. When you've got a, uh, something that's, that's millions, of, you know, 60 million years ago, uh, the dinosaurs were walking. And in 60 million years from now, who knows what's going to happen. So mm-hmm. even though we may be creating a, a, a geological epoch, which will probably, uh, if it continues, wipe out all life on Earth as we know it, uh, for the Earth itself, that may not be such a big thing. <laughs> yeah. When you look at the bigger picture, it tends to be that way, isn't it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I like when you talk about uh, Buckminster Fuller in your book, and you know it's the best way to change an existing model is by building a new one and making the old one obsolete. And a lot of times when we talk about, as you talk about what we've done and the choices we've made and approaching how we raise, prepare, and eat our food, 
I keep I constantly bring up Alan Watts. I, I can't help myself with this one because he wrote such a marvelous essay called Murder in the Kitchen. And he says that very thing in the beginning of his essay is that we tend to prepare, we think about, uh, we grow, and we eat our food as though we hated it. And, you know, he goes through talking about how we went about getting to this point, and then he switches it, and then the last part of his essay talks about what the ideal kitchen would look like, what it would have, and herbs in the window and so forth. And so he starts moving toward a solution that you think, you know, that's how a kitchen really should be. It's a place where people gather around and they talk. It's not blocked off from the rest of the house, for instance. In, in fact, it's the center of attention, you know, because that's the way it always was. You gather around the campfire. Now, in taking a look uh, in what you present here, let's move towards some solutions people can take a look at. And I think one of the biggest things, would be, you know, someone decides, well, I want to go ahead and I'll start a little garden out in my front yard. Where do you get the right seeds? Because there's a lot of concern about, for instance, the Monsanto Corporation basically monopolizing that and making seeds that don't reproduce themselves and so forth. But let's go ahead and start there, basically, I guess. Well, that's pretty simple. You buy organic seeds, buy okay. certified organic seeds. And people may say, well, why would I want to buy certified organic seeds? You know, they're probably just, uh, you know, more expensive, or I'm not planning on growing certified organic or this or that. <laughs> but the, the fact is that certified organic seeds are, 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 are very different from the manufactured seeds. Or, well, I should say manufactured, but they're... <clears throat> they're industrialized seeds, industrialized how about that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the ones that are used for industrialized agriculture, which most people buy because they're so plentiful, uh, are actually not designed for uh, gardening in your backyard. Uh, they're grown in test plots that are uh, that that provide plants that have a uniform size so that machines can go through them. They are grown so that all the fruits come at the same time so that everything can be maximized as far as the crop is concerned. When you buy organic seeds, certified organic seeds, what you're buying is a seed that grows differently because it's been bred to grow differently. Mm -hmm. And that is that it, it uh, usually will come up much quicker and it's going to grow much faster. And it will put its energy in different ways. And that the reason for that is so that it can outgrow the weeds that are around it. Uh, things that make growing organically uh, uh, better. And you're going to have a little bit more diversity in the seed. You may have different times. Uh, different thing, indeterminate and determinate, you know, that's a, 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 a concept that is involved in, in growing organically, you know, so that you're not growing everything that comes at the same time. Uh, they're, just, they're just grown differently to begin with. Plus, then what you can do is, uh, is take those seeds, it's called seed saving, and uh, you just keep planting from the seeds that are provided from your plants, the ones that you grow. And what that does is it acclimates your plants to where you live so mm -hmm. that the plants that grow well where you live, if you save those seeds, then they've got uh, essentially a little leg up on the next, uh, the next crop. And people know this. You know, for thousands of years, people practiced seed saving. That's all there was. They didn't go to the store. You know, they saved the seeds of the plants that grew best in their gardens, and they planted those. And so what happens is that, you uh, you evolve a relationship with the plants that you grow. That's a, the first thing to do. Mm -hmm. You know, and on that note, uh, there was a series of uh, segments that we produced about five years ago, uh, starting with the first book, uh, and it was a story about a girl in Russia called Anastasia. And there was an interesting practice that was talked about in this book, and I thought, you know, that kind of made sense when we talk about uh, what you're talking about here, which is spiritual eating, you know, spiritual. Uh, and that is what the suggestion was, is that you have this garden that you're growing, that each day, maybe up to twice a day, what you go do is you take yourself a fresh little pan of water, you go out to the garden barefoot, and you wash your feet in this water, you just wash them off, and then you wash off your hands, and you just let that water run into the garden. What will happen is then the plant will pick up on the energy of that water that comes off of your body. 
You're not using soap, you're just using the water itself. And it will begin to adjust itself almost medicinally and spiritually so that that way it becomes even better for you when it comes time to harvest. And I thought, that's an interesting thing. And then from there was a cross-reference to, I guess, a really well-known book called uh, it's something about the secret history of plants or something like that about plants. And I'm sure you know about the book I'm talking about. But I thought, that is an interesting way to really connect with things on a real spiritual level. What are your thoughts on something like that? Okay. Well, throughout time, indigenous peoples have thanked the beings that are that we do not see mm-hmm. for the crops that are produced. Now, uh, in uh, Rudolf Steiner, in, in his book, in his agriculture course at the turn of the century, uh, in which uh, the whole system of biodynamic farming is based on, people all over the world practice biodynamic farming, which recognizes that there are unseen spirits regarding our food and that that allowing uh, these unseen things to uh, grow and prosper uh, is part of the growing uh, method. If you look back, as even in I put in my book, the, the Essenes, had uh, most most uh, a bunch of rituals in uh, regarding the angels uh, 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 providing for food, and so these these uh, ways of thanking unseen spirits and beings of the land to uh, help you in the harvest of your food is a time honored tradition. Now, I didn't go into a great deal of of, uh, of uh, uh, detail in my book regarding that because I know that there are people who have many different ways of looking at these things. But if you want to read more about them, then you, you know my other five books have plenty <laughs> regarding that, regarding uh, non-ordinary reality, being able to see things like that, shamanism, uh, being able to perceive non-ordinary reality is something everyone can do. And at the very end of the book, I do have uh, an exercise in how to train yourself in that. And if you want to read more, my uh, previous book before that, Dreams of the Reiki Shaman, goes into great detail about that. Mm -hmm. Fascinating subject. And I think people, uh, I see uh, uh, living in Portland, Oregon, for instance, uh, you were talking about community sustainable agriculture, is that you're seeing uh, there's a tremendous amount of world-class restaurants in the city itself. And a lot of them are really drawing from locally grown organic foods. You know, they're not really buying so much from the big industrialized food suppliers uh, that restaurants, especially restaurant chains, tend to buy from, and they're very seasonal, so menus are changing on a regular basis depending on what they're able to get a hold of that's fresh and in season. And I'll tell you, it gets really exciting to go into a restaurant where you can almost say, why don't you just pick something on the menu for me because you know all of it's going to be good. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's part of the, the great food movement uh, today is, uh, you know, now the chefs are the superstars. Right, which and is what they should have been all along. <laughs> absolutely. I, I, I think it's wonderful. Uh-huh. And uh, one of the things that, that even some of the, uh, the top, the top uh, Michelin-rated restaurants are doing is having their own gardens. I mean, uh, Emeril, as a matter of fact, uh, has... Uh, Lagasse has uh, a bunch of, you know, he grows his own food for his restaurants. And mm-hmm. uh, and this is something that's even uh, going down into the smaller uh, smaller areas. And, uh, you know, I, one of the things I am, I'm president of the Mississippi Fruit and Vegetable Growers Association, which is the trade organization for commercial growers in Mississippi, which is a big surprise being an organic guy. <laughs> but uh, that was a surprise to me anyway. I'm one of the few organic growers in the state. But anyway, uh, one of the things that that we've at all our conferences and so forth is to make sure that we have workshops for people who want to uh, grow and even for what's called backyard market growers. That's a that's a big uh, 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 growing field right now, and that's where people who just have a backyard will actually grow food and and sell it to local like uh, local food co-ops and to mm-hmm. restaurants and to really whoever uh, whoever wants to buy it. Mm-hmm. I know uh, a, a wonderful experience, Jim, that I had is that we visited with uh, my wife's parents, and they live in a, a Skokie 
uh, Illinois, which is just outside of Chicago, I guess 20, 30 minutes north. And uh, he's a Philippine man, her father. And it was interesting to be in their neighborhood because you look all the way down the neighborhood and you see these brick-layered houses. They pretty much almost all look the same. They all had front, small, plotted green yards, except for his. In the front, he had magnificent kale of purple and green to the size and, and density of, that I had never seen before. In the backyard, an herb garden, you know, and string beans, and you name it, I mean. And in this little yard that was the same size as everyone else's in the front and the back, he probably had just about every animal in the neighborhood. He would actually trap them, and then he would take them out to the park and let them go. And what this guy produced in this yard not only was abundant. I mean, he would actually have family members of other families coming over and getting food. He had more than enough. And and not only that, but it also had just this intrinsic beauty about it. And to see this one thing, you know, everybody else's yard looked the same but his. And I thought, I wonder what it would be like if just every house on this block would all do the same thing. You know, the local markets <laughs> would have more than enough to feed quite a few people. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's, a, that's a wonderful thing. I, what, what you say, that beauty of that, you know, you can tell that, that a, a, a property like that is, is full of heart. Right. It's full of love, it's full of heart, it's full of synergy with all the beings around him in, in a loving and gentle way. And that's a that's a beautiful oasis. It's beautiful to see something like that. You know, the the people who print my book is a Finthorn Press, and I I think that uh, uh, that that if you go back and look in, the, I mentioned in the book about Finthorn in Scotland, which right. Is in fact, I was just about to say something about that. So uh, what what in Finthorn in Scotland is is a uh, is is called a is recognized by the UN as an Echo Village. It's based on that principle of of providing for all the goodness, and that's the seen and the unseen, as a uh, physical, material, and spiritual place. And, and that's what, what that fellow's doing there. So you can see that, that he's, he's living holistically. And the exciting, too, for the listeners out there is to realize that if you just even began to participate on your own just to move in this direction, you would see that these things such as fairies and the like are all going to become very, very real. <laughs> I think that most people, uh, in their heart of hearts, they know that there's a lot more than than what they see with their physical eyes. Mm-hmm. It's what in uh, my my teachers taught me, the Native American teachers taught me to see with my spirit eyes. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people, if they just kind of, uh, you know, if they let their little ego uh, or personality, the the voice that they hear, who they think they are, if they listen to who they really are, and that's the the silence there, that uh, the still small voice then uh, they will live and see uh, more with their spirit eyes, that's for sure. I know it's an interesting thought, Jim, to think to yourself that you're a lot better than you think you are, but you're a lot worse than you can possibly imagine. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my. (laughs) The book is called Conscious Food, Sustainable Growing, Spiritual Eating. Our guest today, Jim Pathfinder Ewing. Always a pleasure to have you on the program here. Give folks your website. Uh, it's blueskywaters.com, blueskywaters.com. And begin taking the step for conscious food and spiritual eating. Wonderful stuff. Jim, thank you again for being on the Beyond 50 radio program. Thank you, Daniel. It's wonderful to be here, and I look forward to coming back again sometime. You got it, my friend. Okay. Well, I also want to thank you, the listeners out there. Again, take action with what we share with you here today, and you can also take another action step. Just get on that computer and go to beyond50radio.com, and you can find out more about this. We'll also have a hot link there for you for Jim Pathfinder Ewing's book, which is Conscious Eating. We want to thank you for tuning in. You've been listening to the Beyond 50 Radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. Remember, live your day past halfway.